Hello, um, my name is Timothy Gowers and I would like to welcome you to this course and to Cambridge. Um, it's a very strange year as we all know and I hope you've um, settled in particularly if you're new to Cambridge. Um, I'm feeling quite nervous giving this lecture, oddly more nervous than I would be standing in front of a, a room full of people simply because there's something odd about um, talking alone to my laptop uh, knowing that then I will later be watched by all of you. Um, but uh, I'm sure that's nothing to the nervousness that some of you will be feeling about embarking on uh, part three. Um, it is very hard work. I hope it will be something manageable this year and I hope you'll have a, a very good experience, particularly a good um, intellectual experience. But uh, there's no doubt that it's an odd way of doing things. Um, now, just so the only thing I can say is that it's odd for all of us. Now, uh, I want to start by just saying a few things about uh, how the course will run um, and how I plan to lecture and how I plan to respond to this unusual set of circumstances. Then I'll say a few words about uh, what combinatorics is and sort of what I'm going to be trying to do mathematically in the course. So um, because of the, uh, the fact that the lectures are online, um, I felt that it was worth changing my style of lecture to some extent. I don't want to try to reproduce too closely what I would do if I were standing at a blackboard. So just as what I would normally do is stand at the blackboard and as I speak, I would write down a complete set of notes and people in the, in the lecture theatre would then copy down those notes into their own, on their own pieces of paper, and then they would then have their own set of notes. Um, it's a slightly strange system. If you're an educational theorist, then the idea of just sitting there blindly copying something, um, potentially not understanding a word of what you're copying, is not considered a particularly efficient way of teaching. I find actually, I, I defend it a little bit. I find it a, a surprisingly, I find when I was an undergraduate myself, I found I often thought I'd been to a lecture and understood almost nothing while copying. And then when I came to revise later, I realized that by some mysterious process, this sort of effort of having to write the thing down that you're seeing on the blackboard had actually caused things to sink in that I, without my quite realizing. Nevertheless, um, I think the idea of using that approach when you're not in a room in real time with me at a blackboard, but instead sitting in front of a computer watching a video, the idea of copying something that's on a video down onto a piece of paper, that just seems completely mad. So I'm changing my approach um, this, for this year. I couldn't know what effect it will have in the future, but uh, for now I'm going to change it. And I am preparing printed notes um, and I've actually prepared quite a few of them and I've, I've made uh, what I've done so far available on the course Moodle page. So do go and have a look at that and there's a link there and you can uh, have access to the notes as they are so far. So they'll cover, I should think, uh, the first three weeks or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, then I thought to myself, well, if there are printed notes and um, if you're not expected to copy down notes while I'm lecturing, that sort of frees me up a little bit to lecture in a slightly different way. Not to, I certainly don't want to just to say in the lecture precisely what you've got written down in the printed notes. I want to be free to um, lecture a little bit more in the style of a research seminar. So in a research seminar, one doesn't try necessarily to give the last possible detail of every single proof because people just get lost. Instead, you just want to try to convey the ideas behind what you're talking about. <clears throat> now, I don't want to go as far as that in a course because you have got to learn the material and you've got to uh, take an exam on it if you're taking an exam on this course. So I'm not saying that I'm not going to give full details of the proof. I will give proofs, but I won't necessarily present them in written form in quite the neatest sort of way that I would if, if it were notes that you were having to copy out. Instead, I will try to make the, uh, the, the videos that I produce a bit more chatty somehow. Um, and I hope that that way you'll get the best of both worlds. You'll, you'll get um, 
sort of the kind of chat that you might have a bit more formal, but just when you're when someone's trying to explain something to you um, as an individual, you know, so like sort of one to one, maybe you can even sort of maybe it'll feel a little bit when you're watching me on a video as though I'm just talking to you and not to everybody else who's watching the video. Um, so I want to have something of the feel of a conversation, even if you're not actually responding to what I say. Um, and uh, on the one hand, but then the sort of completely formal stuff will be there in the printed notes. Um, so in particular, if I do, I will try not to do this, but if I, if I, if some of my explanations on the videos are a little unclear or a little bit too informal, so you don't quite get the idea, as I said, that I, that will be a sign that I haven't quite succeeded, but nevertheless, it's possible that might happen. If it does happen, you'll have the details there in the printed notes and you can go and look at them and work out what on earth I was talking about from the printed notes. Um, how you actually use the printed notes is an interesting question. Should you read them in advance so that uh, then when I lecture, you kind of have your, you, you've got the sort of preparation there until I mean you'll understand more easily what I'm saying as I lecture. Or should you watch the lecture as well as you can um, understand as much as you can and in that way be prepared in order to read the printed notes um, and get as, and find those as easy to read as possible. I don't really know what the best answer to that is. I think maybe you should just experiment or maybe you could do a third possibility which would be to read the notes rather quickly before the lecture then watch the lecture then read the notes again in more detail. Anything's possible. I thought it would be best not to dictate to you what to do so I'm, I decided I, I could have for example decided I wouldn't release the printed notes until after I've lectured the topic. I thought that was just treating you like children. You're adults now, uh, so it's up to you how you use the printed notes. Um, nobody's telling you you've got to read them in advance or you can't read them in advance. It's uh, whatever works best. And it may work best in different ways for different people. Okay, um, now another thing that I want to do a little bit differently because of um, the fact that it's on video and not uh, in a lecture is it seems to me that while going to a lecture for 50 minutes is one thing i say 50 minutes not an hour because in cambridge the convention is to start at five past and finish at five two so people have time to move between lectures so sitting through a 50 minute lecture is okay sometimes it gets a bit you know you start looking at your watch 35 minutes in but um anyway it's all right but watching a 50 minute video is there's something slightly sort of soul destroying about it. And I think uh, videos tend to work better. I think there's a reason that TED talks, for example, are 15 minutes. I somehow they work better if, uh, if they're shorter. So what I'm going to try to do is to divide the lectures up into chunks that are really bite sized chunks, sort of instead of packing what I can into 50 minutes. And then if I'm in the middle of a theorem at the end of the 50 minutes, I'll say, okay, well, we'll carry on with that next lecture or something like that. Rather, I will just try to, um, for example, if there's, a, if there's a theorem with a shortage proof and the whole thing takes 15 minutes, well, that'll make a nice little video. And then there'll be another theorem after that, and that'll make another nice little video. And so I'll aim to have shorter videos, but you'll want to have some means of, uh, knowing where you are in a course. So if that means there'll be many more videos than 16. There's a 16 lecture course. I think there may be sort of 30 or 40 videos by the end. So um, in order to make it clear where I am in the course, I've decided I'll, I'll number the videos in the following way. Um, I'll say something, if, if the video is, for example, 8.3, then the eight will mean that we are officially in lecture eight. And the point three will mean this video starts point three of the way through or 30% of the way through. So given that the lecture is 15 minutes, that'll mean it'll be 15 minutes in to lecture eight, if it's 8.3. So I hope that's reasonably clear. So if you, if, you can, if you calculate that there should have been nine lectures by now, then if you're, you should be watching a video that's got a nine, at least, if you want to be keeping up with the course. Uh, one last sort of pre-lecture announcement. Um, I plan to uh, have my, um, there will be a sort of weekly slot where you can talk to me um, and that'll be on Tuesdays at 3.30. And um, 
in some of the weeks that will be examples classes that'll be weeks three five and uh, sorry three six and eight and the remaining weeks will be um office hours so that's one two four five and seven um i've never well actually i have given office hours in the physical sense um these i think uh I always worry in front of in, in advance of these sorts of things that uh, nobody will have anything to say and then it'll be just sort of weird. I'll be sitting in front of the screen, nobody has any questions. So to make it as likely as possible that you will have questions, I think my side of the bargain is that um, I will be very uh, flexible about what sorts of questions that you can ask. It'll be sort of like an ask me anything on Reddit or something. Except that it won't be quite anything. Uh, it, it should be mathematical. And the more mathematical, and in particular, the more closely related it is to the course, the higher a priority I will give the question. So if you want to ask me a very general question, like <clears throat> how do you decide to work, what to work on when you're doing research or something like that, I'm very happy to answer it, but only if um, we've run out of questions like, uh, what did you mean in number 2.1 when you said blah, blah, blah. So that's how I hope the office hours will work. And I hope that having that extra contact, which a normal um, part three student doesn't get, will be another means by which this odd experiment may in some ways be better than uh, what you would have if you were coming to do part three in a conventional year. So there are things that you won't have, and we're trying as hard as possible as a faculty to compensate for those by giving you other things that you wouldn't have had otherwise, and we'll see how it works. Um, I can't remember whether I've said this for the weird reason that I actually recorded more or less everything I'm saying. Oh, sorry, I tried, I thought I'd recorded it and then realized I'd forgotten to press record. So I'm doing all this for the second time. So apologies if I'm saying this twice, but, um, because it's all rather experimental, uh, if you can very, very gently uh, offer feedback about how it's going and how you feel that this particular method of lecturing is working, um, then I'm receptive to that. I mean, if, if you feel that there's some simple fix that would make the course clearly better, then please feel free to suggest it. Um, and uh, I won't necessarily agree with what you say, but I'll definitely listen to it and uh, it'll definitely, you know, it may, it, there's a positive chance that it will affect what I do and affect it for the better. Okay, <clears throat> I think I will now just say just a few words about uh, what combinatorics is and what I'm hoping to achieve in the course. So let me just uh, get my screen up. Um, sorry, I've just lost the button. There we are. Okay. <clears throat> so what is combinatorics? Well, we can think of it in all sorts of different ways. Uh, one way we could think about it is what do we study in combinatorics? So what are the sort of objects of study? So if you've done a first course, then probably something that you'll already familiar with is graphs. Um, but there's a lot more to combinatorics than graphs. So let me just start. Here's something else that we, we sometimes talk about. Hypergraphs. What's a hypergraph? Well, what's a graph, first of all? If you're being very formal about it, a graph is a set. Uh, let's call it x. Um, in fact, let's not call it X. Let's call it V because that's what's usually called. Um, and we have a set E, which consists of pairs of elements of V. And a hypergraph, well, <clears throat> a hypergraph is where we just generalize the notion of pairs. In particular, a k-uniform hypergraph. In fact, let's start with a three-uniform hypergraph. I'm very fond of three-uniform hypergraphs. Mm. 
we just replace pairs by triples. And in general, a k-uniform hypergraph, we replace triples by k-tuples. And a hypergraph, if you don't say it's k-uniform for some k, is just any bunch of subsets of V. So in general, a hypergraph is the same as something called a set system. So a set system is just a bunch of subsets of a set. Um, and there are all sorts of fascinating things that one can ask about set systems. And we'll come to some of those during the course. Uh, what else could we ask about? Um, we can talk about sets of numbers, for example. And uh, we could also talk about sets of points in the plane. And we can also talk about, actually, this is, I'm going to say something here. We can talk about subsets of naught one to the n. So what is naught one to the n? It is the set of all zero one sequences of length n. Now, You'll notice if you're feeling very alert that a subset of naught one is actually exactly the same as a set system or a hypergraph because subsets of naught uh, one to the n, uh, we can think of, so we can take any sequence of noughts and ones. Okay, here I've taken n equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That corresponds to the set instead of positions where you've got a one. So two, three, five, seven, eight, nine. So you can see there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between subsets of the numbers from one to nine and zero one sequences of length nine. Uh, so a subset of naught to one to the end, I wouldn't say it is a set system, but uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between subsets of naught one to the n and set systems where you've got subsets of a set of size n. Um, nevertheless, sometimes it's more convenient to think about set systems and sometimes it's more convenient to think about naught one to the n. And we can generalize the idea of naught one to the n in an obvious way. We could take subsets of, for example, naught one two to the n. Uh, and also another thing that we like taking subsets of is subsets of G, where G is a group, sometimes a specific group, sometimes a general group. Now let's have a look at all these types of things. There is actually something they've all got in common, and that is every single one, you take something structured and you take a subset of it. So a graph is a subset of all the pairs of elements of V, or you could, in graph theoretic terms, you could say a graph is a subset of a complete graph. Similarly, a hypergraph is a subset of the set of triples. So the complete graph is quite a structured object. A graph is just an arbitrary subset of the complete graph. Similarly, the set of all triples of a set is a quite a structured object, and then a, a three uniform hypergraph is a subset of that. The set of, let's say, positive integers, is an extremely structured set, but a subset of the set of positive integers or a subset of the numbers from one to n, for example. Um, the point about it is we don't just look at that subset as a set, in which case why take the set of a set of numbers? It could be just a subset of any countable set. Then that wouldn't be combinatorics. That wouldn't, wouldn't be anything. But uh, if you've got a set of the positive integers, then the positive integers have all sorts of structure. They've got additive structure, order structure, and that sort of thing. And uh, we can ask about how that interacts with the particular subset we've taken, or with a subset that has certain properties. You know, what, what, what else can we say about it? Similarly, the, the plane has a lot of structure. 
And then we, we can take an arbitrary subset of that and ask various things. We can ask about um, collinear triples, you know, how many can there be under certain circumstances, all sorts of questions. That's, that's a branch of combinatorics called combinatorial geometry. Sets of numbers, that's combinatorial number theory. Um, and then subsets of naught one to the end, those perhaps not too surprisingly have because uh, have, have a lot of applications in uh, computer science. There's a lot of interest in computer science in subsets of naught one to the end, which can be yet thought of in yet a different way. We can say if a zero, a zero one sequence belongs to the subset, we can define a function that takes that uh, zero one sequence to one. And if it doesn't belong to the subset, it will take it to zero. So that gives us a one-to-one -one correspondence between subsets of naught one to the n and functions from sequences of noughts and ones to naught and one. And there, I think you can see that that's got something to do with computer science because uh, computers are working out functions of zero one sequences to, to zero one the whole time. Um, and subsets of groups, so all sorts of really, so a group again is something that's got a lot of structure and then a, an arbitrary subset of a group. Um, the point is, it's not completely, you might think that, that uh, well, if, if all I tell you is you, here's a subset of a group, that's not really telling you anything interesting, but I could ask, uh, if, I, if I tell you something like that the subset has uh, positive density inside the group, then immediately that uh, gives you really quite a lot of information and you can deduce all sorts of non-trivial things about the subset just from the fact that it's a, a subset of positive density and we'll see examples of that for specific groups. Um, later in the course. Now that's I've told you a little bit about the, the objects of study, but actually that's not really my main emphasis in this course. My main emphasis in the course is on techniques. I'm going to put that in capital letters just because I... So what I want to convey to you is that um, there are all sorts of different ways of proving results in combinatorics. Combinatorial is a bit like magpies. We go around sort of stealing nice ideas from other branches of mathematics. And uh, so I shall show you applications of all sorts of things like probability, number theoretic methods, geometry, topology, probability, did I say that? Um, analysis, linear algebra, um, and uh, entropy. So um, I hope that uh, that will convey to some extent how combinatorics sort of interacts quite a lot with uh, other branches of mathematics. So what I've just said there is more, it's not really interaction, that's just taking ideas from other areas of mathematics, but it also gives back um, in, in, those, in a number of situations. Um, quite often when you're looking at another branch of mathematics, you, you use all the sort of tools of that and then the problem is still hard. There's some sort of stubborn bit that remains. And quite often that is in the end something that one could regard or, or as being combinatorial. Actually, the way I like to think of combinatorics or the way I like to think about the sort of maths I like is it's problems that you can reasonably attack from first principles. Um, and I want to say first principles, I, I don't really quite mean first principles. You need to have some kind of uh, um, background in undergraduate mathematics to, to be fairly strong on the basics. But uh, you don't have to spend a long apprenticeship uh, where you're reading some big fat textbook like Hartshorn in Algebraic Geometry or something. You, you can, um, after you've done part three, if you do a PhD in combinatorics, you'll probably be set a serious interesting problem right from the wide go. Which is not to say, I mean, this course, part of what I'm just aiming to do in this course is to equip you with some non-obvious techniques that will then make you a stronger combinatorialist at the end of the course. Okay, um, I think I've said enough. So I'm going to end this preliminary lecture uh, and then I will see how long it takes and then I'll, when I start the first. So technically we're still in the middle of the first lecture at the end of the first video. And uh, so there we go. Now I can't work out how to end the recording. Yes, I can. So goodbye for now and see you next video.